from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome once again to another episode of The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors around the world. I'm your host, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. Now, last week, we began a discussion of America's first tentative steps towards producing a sculpture which aligned with the European figurative tradition. Now, we see that from the outset, American sculptors were attracted to the style of neoclassical sculpture, which was dominant in Europe at the time, and these largely self-taught sculptors attempted to emulate as best they could this neoclassical style, even if sometimes they didn't particularly understand what the neoclassical ethos and aesthetic was all about. It was enough for sculptors like William Rush and Horatio Greeno to understand that if they could make their work look like European neoclassicism, it would be thought well of by literate and well-traveled Americans. Now, in some ways, this imperfect understanding of neoclassicism by American sculptors, and in turn the American public, might have been the best thing to happen to 19th century American sculpture. Had the likes of Horatio Greeno and those who followed him more completely absorbed the aesthetic principles laid down by Johannes Fankelmann in the late 18th century in written works that would influence the likes of Antonio Canova and Bertolt Torvaldsen, American sculptors might have produced works basically identical in form and function to everyone else's in Europe at the time. But instead, American sculptors took the forms of neoclassicism and academic training and adapted these forms to the needs and expectations of American culture and American sensibilities. And this is actually really important to consider. The general public in America was relatively isolated from European influence on that culture. And consequently, native-born Americans were born free of European baggage of all types. European expectations and cultural norms were different. They had different cultural priorities and values. What was considered beyond the pale in one culture was the norm in the other, and vice versa. And American sculptors were also free of the baggage that came with an education and allegiance to the national academies of Europe, like the Royal Academy in London and the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris. In Paris, in the 1830s, it was almost unthinkable to produce a sculpture outside the genres and types of biblical, historical, or mythological narratives. But American sculptors had no such restrictions placed upon them by their national schools because those national schools barely existed. Nor did the American public make particular demands on artists as it was a public which had no expectations at all of what sculpture might consist of. And this gave rise, almost immediately in the work of American sculptors, to a truly national style and ethos that was as free and as diverse as anything going on in Europe in the middle of the 19th century. And this particularity and diversity of American sculpture at the time is often overlooked today. Today, when we talk about the explosion of diversity of style and subject in the 19th century, we usually begin and end that discussion with the work of French sculptors like Carpeaux and Frémier and Paul Dubois, starting in the 1850s and 1860s. But this same blossoming of styles and subjects happened simultaneously in American sculpture, but this fact often passes without comment. So today, we're going to look at the life and times of one of the greatest American sculptors of the 19th century, a man by the name of Hiram Powers. He himself is a good example of the kind of person aspiring American sculptors were, as opposed to the typical European art student. And also, we're going to look at how the work of Hiram Powers was received in America, and that will illustrate very well just what was different about American sculpture and the culture which produced it. So Hiram Powers was born the same year as Horatio Greeno in 1805. The nation of the United States was about 30 years old at that time. Hiram Powers was the son of a poor farmer in Vermont who moved to Cincinnati, Ohio when Hiram was in his teens, Hiram being one of nine children. Now, his parents both died soon after the move, and Hiram was raised by his uncle, a lawyer, but Hiram Powers immediately had to leave school to work, and he eventually took a job with a clockmaker when he was 17. 
and it was here in the clockmaker's shop that Hiram first showed a talent bordering on a genius for mechanics. In another life, Hiram Powers might have ended up on the list of early American inventors alongside Thomas Edison and Robert Fulton. He learned a great deal about clockworks and mechanics in general and started devising mechanical apparatus on his own time. And after working for the clockmaker for over five years, Hiram took a different job that offered him more creativity and was, to Hiram, much more interesting. And this was at the Dorfe's Western Museum. The Western Museum, and it should be pointed out that in the 1820s, Cincinnati, Ohio, was actually in the western part of the United States. The Western Museum was sort of an exhibition hall full of various displays, you know, taxidermied animals, geological specimens, and also wax figures like you find today at Madame Tussauds. Basically, anything that was interesting or curious or scientific, it was, it was kind of like a curiosity cabinet writ large. One of Hiram's jobs at the Western Museum was to restore a collection of second-hand wax dummies that the owner had recently purchased. Now, not only was Hiram to restore them cosmetically, but he was also hired to animate them as well, giving the wax figures internal clockworks which would set them in motion. Pretty cool job, right? But the really cool part of this story, in my opinion, is what Hiram Powers did with these wax figures and who guided him in his work. It involves one of those fateful encounters you sometimes find in the history books of two anonymous people who bump into each other at one stage in their respective lives and then who separately end up becoming people of true historical significance later in life. And as fate would have it, the 22-year-old Hiram Powers would meet at the Western Museum an English 48-year-old mother struggling to make ends meet by the name of Frances Trollope. Frances Trollope, also popularly known as Fanny Trollope, would in a few years become one of the 19th century's most prolific writers, famous for her candid and penetrating travel memoirs and observations of life and culture in various nations, including Germany, the United States, and Italy. She would also be the author of the first abolitionist novel, a work which directly inspired Harriet Beecher Stowe to write the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, which, of course, is the book which Abraham Lincoln called the book that started this great war. The book that made Fanny Trollope a household name was published in 1832. It was called Domestic Manners of the Americans, and it's a blunt critique of American culture that was widely read in Europe and widely criticized in the United States. For some reason, Fanny Trollope's books are not read that much anymore, but they are full of contemporary insight. They're a compendium of valuable information for students of the 19th century. You know, there's lots of fantastic character sketches and anecdotes of significant figures of all sorts, because Fanny Trollope was at the center of literary and cultural life from the 1830s to the 1860s. But in the 1820s, she was just another struggling immigrant with several mouths to feed. Now, when Fanny Trollope and Hiram Powers met, the two hit it off, and they would become lifelong friends. Fanny, like many people who met Hiram Powers, was attracted to his easy manner, his high energy, and his talkativeness, as well as his intelligence and his ingenuity. And it was Fanny who suggested to Hiram a possible tableau in which to put his clockwork wax figures. She thought that the figures would be excellent in portraying scenes from Dante's Inferno. Now, Hiram Powers was not too familiar with Dante, so Fanny Trollope described several scenes from it which struck Hiram's imagination, and Hiram attacked the theme vigorously. Now, unfortunately, Hiram Powers' waxwork Inferno doesn't survive, but by contemporary accounts, it was a smash hit at the Western Museum. It became so popular that a wire fence had to be constructed around the exhibit to keep the crowds from pushing too close. And, I love this part, for an added effect, Hiram Powers electrified that fence so that the people touching it would receive a shock, which the crowd apparently thought added a touch of realism to the hellish scenario and would intentionally touch it for that added extra effect of realism. Now, waxwork dummies in a museum of curiosities is not the usual route towards a career as a neoclassical sculptor. But the refurbishing of these dummies did apparently awake in Hiram an interest in modeling. And the real lightning bolt came one day when Hiram went to visit the studio of a local sculptor, the German-born Frederick Eckstein. 
Now, Eckstein's father had been the court sculptor to Frederick the Great of Prussia, and both father and son were among the founders of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And Frederick Eckstein took in pupils, and eventually opened a small and short-lived Academy of Fine Art right in Cincinnati. Now, right around the time that Hiram started receiving lessons from Eckstein, Eckstein was carving a few marble portraits. One was of the ever-popular Marquis de Lafayette, and the other of President Andrew Jackson, and uh, Eckstein was carving that portrait from a life mask. This experience seized Hiram Powers with the desire to become a sculptor himself. Hiram Powers was a pupil of Frederick Eckstein for several years, learning modeling, casting, and carving, and he gained a local reputation as a very competent sculptor, as well as an inventive mechanic. Eventually, Hiram's talent drew the attention of a local wealthy patron of the arts, who encouraged Hiram to try to make his fortune in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. He even funded Hiram's trip and gave him letters of introduction to important contacts in Washington. And so, in 1834, at the age of 29, Hiram Powers, who by this time was married and had a child, moved to D.C. Now, if you remember from the Horatio Greeno podcast from last week, there were not a lot of sculptors working in the United States at this time, and just as few active patrons of the arts in the 1820s and 1830s. And in 1834, when, when uh, Hiram Powers moved to Washington, Horatio Greeno was already working in Florence. So Hiram Powers was one of the few native-born sculptors active in Washington, D.C., and because of this he received many commissions, including portrait commissions from Daniel Webster, Senators Calhoun and Preston, and eventually President Andrew Jackson himself. And if you go to the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and go to the image gallery for this episode, which is episode number 61, you will see Hiram Powers' bust of Andrew Jackson. And it's a remarkably naturalistic portrait, even if it is pretty incongruously set on a torso swathed in classical drapery. Now this classical pastiche was the style of the times for portraiture, although the classical togas on these portraits were usually balanced by a slight classicizing of the facial features of the portraits themselves, right? So if you look at a, a standard portrait from the 1830s by, say, Lorenzo Bartolini, the classicism works because it's not just in the drapery and the dress. It's just not the drapery that's classicized, but it also involves facial features. In short, Classicism informs the entire work. But when one models a thoroughly naturalistic portrait, like, like uh, Hiram Powers did, but then gives the work stiff, schematic, classical drapery, like Powers did with his Andrew Jackson, it just doesn't work that well. You know, it's the same sort of issue that Horatio Greeno had with his seated George Washington, with its naturalistic portrait on an idealized, classicized torso. The classicism becomes a pastiche rather than acting as a guiding principle or ethos. Now, classicism and naturalism are really apples and oranges, but you can blend them in a single work. But it has to be done just right, very subtly and very uniformly, or else it just doesn't work. A Canova or Udon or Bartolini could pull it off, but Horatio Greeno, eh, not so much. Anyway, so... After three years of completing portrait commissions in Washington, Hiram Powers, like Horatio Greeno before him, sailed for Italy in 1837. Like Greeno, Powers had only modeled and cast into plaster all these portrait commissions, and then he brought them to Italy with him in order to have them copied into Italian marble. Powers settled in Florence, where he, of course, met and became friends with Horatio Greeno, who was at the time finishing work on his George Washington. And, like Horatio Greeno, Hiram Powers settled into a career making portrait busts for the elites on the Grand Tour. But that's not all Hiram Powers did, of course. On his own time, and on his own initiative, Powers turned his attention to several subjects. One subject was the ideal, first in busts of mythological figures like Proserpina and Ginevra, but also in full-length nude figures a genre he had seldom seen in the United States, but which, of course, pervades the streets and museums of Florence. His first major attempt at an ideal nude came in the early 1840s, and it's a statue called Eve Tempted. We see Eve holding an apple in her hand, and a serpent coils around the tree stump, which acts as a support for the figure. It's a very simple pose and a very simple idea, but it is done exceedingly well. 
As she is Eve, of course, there's no idealizing toga or other drapery to detract from the female figure's lovely naturalism. And although there are idealizing elements within the figure, the vitality of the nude model, the use of which Powers had evidently mastered by this time, shines through. Hiram Powers' Eve is the first successful attempt by an American sculptor to strike that delicate balance between classicism and naturalism. Another work he made at this time, another nude, shows just how closely Hiram Powers was considering his potential buying audiences. After his Eve tempted, Powers modeled a male nude youth holding a conch shell to his ear. It's a fisher boy. Now, the genre of the fisher boy in sculpture had met with very recent, very big success in Paris, both with the groundbreaking Neapolitan fisher boy by Francois Rude and the fisher boy dancing the Tarantella by Francisque Duret, both in the early 1830s. But rather than rendering his fisher boy with a lively naturalism, as Duret and Rude had done, Hiram Powers' fisher boy is more Greek than Neapolitan a slender, ideal youth in a slight contrapposto, full of grace. It's really an Italian late neoclassical response to the new romantic naturalism arriving from Paris in the 1840s. Now, at the same time Powers was exploring idealism in the nude figure, he was also experimenting with technique and developed not only unique methods, but also he invented the tools he needed for his unique methods. Powers developed a method of working directly in plaster, not clay, for his original models. He would build the forms up right in plaster, even while working from living models. For him, this saved the time and expense of mold making and casting, and as these ideal figures he was experimenting with were not commissioned work, he was paying for them out of pocket. And with a wife and by now four children, Powers needed to economize. But to work in plaster as effectively as clay, Powers also developed special files and rasps of his own design, even patenting a perforated rasp which prevents plaster from building up on the teeth of the rasp, and it's a type which he invented but is still in very common use today. Although his grand tour portrait busts did provide an income and his nudes were widely admired by all who passed through his studio, Hiram's first figures did not find a buyer willing to commit them to marble for some time. In 1843, after Hiram had been living in Florence for more than five years, he was actually reacquainted with an old friend who had relocated to Florence, none other than Fanny Trollope, who was by now a famous writer. Trollope was dismayed at Hiram Powers' situation, and it just may be that Fanny Trollope suggested, or otherwise influenced, Hiram Powers' next choice of subject in his exploration of the ideal nude. Now, Fanny Trollope was a strong and vocal social activist and abolitionist, and her anti-slavery novel had been published several years before she settled in Florence. In 1843, soon after Fanny Trollope's arrival to Florence, Hiram Powers addressed the issue of slavery in sculpture with a work called The Greek Slave. This was the work that would not only skyrocket Hiram Powers to international fame, not only prove to be a strong symbol for the anti-slavery movement on a par with Uncle Tom's Cabin, but would also be the sculpture that would drag the prudish mindset of the American general public into acceptance of the nude figure in art. And we'll hear all about it when the sculptor's funeral continues. <laughs> What are you doing this summer? Going to the beach, or maybe to the mountains? Or maybe you haven't made your summer plans yet. Well, buddy, I sure have. I'm going to attend the premier event of the summer for figurative sculptors. I'm going to lead an elite cadre of students into the realm of Michelangelo, Bernini, and Rodin. That's right, I am going to carve marble. And you can too. Join me in the Wiltshire Workshop, a two-week adventure in the English countryside where both beginning and advanced sculptors will take the leap from being mere clay modelers who ship their work off to a foundry to have someone else do the real work, to becoming a sculptor of marble in the tradition of all our favorite sculptors. They all knew how to carve, so why not you? The workshop is happening not far from Stonehenge, in the green countryside of Wiltshire, just outside of Marlborough where you'll learn everything you'll need to know in order to carve a figurative work in marble. In addition to learning the basics with hand tools and machine tools, you will learn the process of using a macaneta a punto, 
or pointing machine, the device which enables sculptors to make exact copies of plaster casts in marble. And that's just what you'll do. Choose from a selection of plaster casts taken from the work of master sculptors of the past, Bernini, Udon, Michelangelo, and more, and create your very own true and faithful copy to keep. Not many people can claim to own their own mask of Bernini's St. Teresa or Michelangelo's dying captive in Carrara marble, and even fewer have made it themselves. But you can be one of them. And the workshop just isn't for sculptors with experience. Even complete beginners and non-sculptors can create a marble work of art in two weeks' time. We proved that last year. It can be done. And for those of you who have no experience in carving, well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's actually pretty simple. You just need the right tools and know how to use them. And that's what this workshop is designed to give you, the knowledge of carving and pointing. And after these two weeks, you will be fully equipped with the know-how to carry on carving independently in marble and stone. You'll be able to produce work that will stand out from all the other sculptors who limit themselves to bronze. And in a tight art market like ours, every bit counts. All the information for the Wiltshire Workshop, which starts August 8th, can be found at our website, thesculptorsfuneral.com. There's space for just 12 people on this workshop, and the sign-up deadline is June 1st. But I have a feeling the course is going to fill up early this year based on the success of last year's course. So sign up today at thesculptorsfuneral.com or contact me directly for more details. The Wiltshire Workshop 2016. Become one of the few figurative marble sculptors out there and follow in the footsteps of the old masters. Check it all out at thesculptorsfuneral.com and I'll see you in jolly old England. So Hiram Powers achieved international fame with his statue of the Greek slave. Now why? It's a rather typical late neoclassical style female nude in a pose very similar to the Medici Venus, which of course by this time had been copied and emulated by dozens of sculptors. She stands in a simple contraposto, one hand placed upon the obligatory draped post, which is of course required as a third leg, and which keeps marble nudes from breaking at the ankles. The only conceit towards indicating that she's a slave is that her wrists are shackled to that post. She's basically a Venus in chains. And if we don't know the context, we would think that the title Greek slave is merely a justification for displaying what is ostensibly an antique-inspired female nude with a bit of a twist. In fact, the work directly references an actual historical conflict that had resolved itself only ten years before the Greek slave was modeled. The nation of Greece had won its independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1832. The Greek fight for independence aroused the intense interest of people in Europe and the United States, as the conflict was seen as representative of many things. For the United States, which had to some extent modeled its new government on ancient Greek democracy, the contemporary nation of Greece was seen as a kindred spirit. Many people who believed passionately in the ideals of independence and freedom and democracy fought on the side of the Greeks during the conflict, most notably the poet Lord Byron. And subsequently the conflict became the inspiration for many works of art and literature. But beyond ideals of freedom and democracy, there was also the notion that Greece belonged to us, to Western European culture, and it should not be ruled by them, the Ottoman Turks, a truly foreign culture for many in the West. And it's precisely this chord of us and them that Hiram Powers strikes with his Greek slave. Now, in the context of the Greek War of Independence, we see the Greek slave not as a mere allusion to the antique, but she was seen as a contemporary Greek woman, fallen into the clutches of the heathen enemy. Now, to reinforce the idea that this woman is one of us, Hiram Powers places two small items in her chained hands, a cross and a locket. The cross indicates, of course, that she is a Christian, and the locket, a possible gift from a loved one, or maybe bearing a keepsake inside, refers to loved ones who would come to her aid if they could. Let me read a description of the work written by Hiram Powers himself around the time of the statue's unveiling in 1843. The slave has been taken from one of the Greek islands by the Turks in the time of the Greek Revolution, the history of which is familiar to all. The father and mother, and perhaps all her kindred, have been destroyed by her foes, and she alone preserved, as a treasure too valuable to be thrown away. 
she is now among barbarian strangers, under the pressure of a full recollection of the calamitous events which have brought her to her present state, and she stands exposed to the gaze of the people she abhors, and awaits her fate with intense anxiety, tempered indeed by the support of her reliance upon the goodness of God. Okay, so that's from the sculptor himself. And now we can understand why this work was so popular. It uses the neoclassical idiom to express contemporary ideas and ideals, which in turn link us more strongly to the ethos of the antique than a simple Venus ever could. Few and far between were the neoclassical sculptures that could so directly speak to a contemporary audience. As a consequence, the Greek slave was a sensation, and there was an insatiable demand for the statue. It would be put into marble in a full-size version at least six times, officially, and numerous bootleg copies were made of it as well. Reductions of various sizes were sold, it was reproduced in porcelain, and a version of just the Greek slave's portrait bust was also made available. It was exhibited in 1845 in London, in 1847 in the United States, and then again in 1851 back in England. Writers and commentators from Nathaniel Hawthorne to Maria White Lowell wrote about it, and poets like Whittier and Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote poetry inspired by it. And, in America, and for Americans, the work naturally had an added significance and relevance, coming as it did right before the Civil War in the United States, with the abolitionist movement growing stronger every year, matched in vigor by pro-slavery sentiment. The Greek slave was a perfect propaganda piece for the abolitionists. In the Greek slave, free white Americans could empathize with one of their own in captivity, much more perhaps than they could had the statue depicted an African American in chains. This statue effectively brought both the horror and the hypocrisy of slavery home to many people who observed the statue when it toured in the United States. Now for my money. This work, The Greek Slave, is one of the best examples of neoclassical sculpture I can think of. And when I mean best, I mean most true to the ethos of neoclassicism. Now sure, Canova was certainly a better sculptor, technically. And Torvaldsen was more true to the antique style. But Hiram Power's ability to unite classical and contemporary ideals in a single form leading the viewer past the mere physicality of the nude figure and into the realm of the ideal she represents, might make it the best example of true emulation of the Greeks, according to the theories of Johannes Vankelman. And that's all fine and good, of course, when you've read your Vankelman, or at least are at home in a place like Rome or Florence or Paris or London or, or really anywhere in Europe, exposed as one is to centuries' worth of attempts at the ideal nude from the Renaissance forward. But of course, this was clearly not the case for almost everyone in the United States who had not traveled abroad. The anti-slavery sentiment in the Greek slave was just one way in which the statue caused a commotion back in the United States when it traveled there first in 1847. The other commotion, of course, was caused by its nudity. Now, to get an idea of how the average, or even how the enlightened American, regarded nudity in art, we can quote right from Hiram Power's English friend, Fanny Trollope, who one day went to see the collection of antique casts at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, and she records her experience in her novel, The Domestic Matters of the Americans. We visited the 19th annual exhibition of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. One of the rooms of this academy had inscribed over its door, Antique Statue Gallery. The door was open, but just within it was a screen, which prevented any objects in the room from being seen from without. Upon my pausing to read this inscription, an old woman, who appeared to officiate as a guardian of the gallery, hustled up, and addressing me with an air of much mystery, said, Now, ma'am, now, this is just the time for you. Nobody can see you. Make haste. I stared at her with unfeigned surprise, and disengaging my arm, which she had taken apparently to hasten my movements, I very gravely asked her meaning. Only, ma'am, that ladies like to go into that room by themselves, when there be no gentlemen watching them. Now, it was common practice in American museums like the Pennsylvania Academy and the Boston Athenaeum 
that men and women would have separate viewing time for works of art which depicted the nude. It seems almost impossibly prudish and quaint, but it has to be remembered that naked flesh in America was literally nowhere to be found represented publicly. The only time one encountered the nude figure was when you encountered an actual naked person in America, an encounter which, of course, was uncommon except between intimates, like spouses and family, maybe a doctor. The extremely rare instance of encountering a nude in a work of art must have carried almost as much power and intimacy, and people at first just didn't know how to react to it. But at the same time, people knew that they should react to these works of art, as the Venus or the Apollo plaster cast that they had come to see had been advertised to them as representing the greatest masterpieces of European art. So going to an exhibition with a group of friends or peers, one might be expected to express some sort of opinion or admiration for what one was looking at, which would, of course, reveal one's learning and worldliness, or lack thereof, to one's peers. But when you have little to no experience or understanding as to why the figure was nude, what else are you going to comment upon but the nudity itself? And how does one talk about that in a genteel way? And wasn't such talk, no matter how delicate, simply improper conversation in front of members of the opposite sex? I mean, we need to take all of that into account. I mean, it wasn't so much that the average American was scandalized by a, a statue's nudity, per se. Separation of the sexes was merely a way of avoiding embarrassing social mistakes in what was a completely unfamiliar social situation for everybody. So in that context, I can actually appreciate the voices who decried the nudity in art, because at least they were giving their honest opinion and not feigning appreciation, as many did publicly, but who would then express their bemusement privately. The classical and neoclassical ideals which ideal nudes strove for were largely lost on the American public, who had no experience and little guidance in looking past the material nude towards loftier sentiment. So it was inevitable that what many saw in a Venus or an Adonis was nothing more than an exposure of flesh, ostensibly for the sake of exposing flesh, and therefore lascivious. But Hiram Power's Greek slave changed all that. In terms of motive, the Greek slave is practically the opposite of the Venus from who she takes her pose. The Greek slave is not an unashamed, nude, pagan goddess of love. She is a faithful Christian, unclothed not by choice, but stripped of her garments against her will by her heathen enemies. Her nudity, then, becomes not a subject of scorn, but one of pity. Now, the Greek slave didn't change opinions about the nude in art in the United States overnight. It, it actually had to be carefully orchestrated and prepared for. And once the statue arrived on American shores, it had to be repeatedly defended. The main tactic that defenders of the Greek slave used was to let the public know, before they saw it, that the Greek slave was fundamentally different from the usual antique casts that the public already knew and was scandalized by. The U.S. Consul to Italy wrote a lengthy defense and justification for having this work, The Greek Slave, tour America, stating, So far from feeling any apprehension that the exhibition of this statue in America would have a tendency to introduce among our women foreign indelicacy, characteristic of every country in the world but our own, and the British Islands, I am persuaded it would be warmly greeted by all the enlightened and all the pure of both sexes, and leave every spectator with a more exalted conception of the beauty and the divinity of nature. And I would even venture to say that I should be compelled to fear of everyone who, after seeing it, should pronounce a different opinion, that the character of the spectator was not right. Somewhat surprisingly, various prominent members of the clergy in the United States spoke in favor of the Greek slave as well pointing out that the nudity of the statue, unlike its European counterparts, had a moral purpose. Reverend Orville Dewey stated in a pamphlet that there ought to be some reason for exposure besides beauty, like fidelity to history, as with Eve, or helpless constraint, as in the Greek girl. He went on to contrast it to the Medici Venus, saying, unlike the Greek slave, a Venus has no sentiment but modesty. She has neither done anything, nor is she going to do anything. 
nor is she in a situation to awaken any moral emotion. Now, when the statue finally arrived in 1847 and was put on display at the National Academy of Design in New York at the annual exhibition, it was placed on a revolving pedestal so that it could be turned for different views and different effects of light, but also because it was placed with a large velvet curtain behind it so that spectators who wished to see other exhibits in the same room would not be unwillingly exposed to the nudity of the Greek slave. Now, the curtain was largely unnecessary, however, as the Greek slave drew in hundreds of viewers every day, some traveling hundreds of miles to see it. One magazine reported the general reaction of the audience. It is most curious to observe the effect produced upon visitors. They enter gaily, or with an air of curiosity. They look at the beauteous figure, and the whole manner undergoes a change. Men take off their hats. Ladies seat themselves silently and almost unconsciously, and usually it is a minute before a word is uttered. All conversation is in a hushed tone, and everybody looks serious on departing. Another reporter wrote that one is scarce conscious of gazing upon a nude figure, clothed as the poor girl seems in the love and the sorrow of the angels. Now the success and the acceptance of the Greek slave was such that after its initial exhibition in New York, it went on to be shown in Washington, Boston, Springfield, Salem, Providence, Portland, and even to Cincinnati, Hiram Power's hometown. The reception of the statue in these places was never unanimous in praise of its virtues, but the tide had definitely turned for the reception of the nude in sculpture. In the 1850s, the work began to appear in reduced scales, as I mentioned, in alabaster and ceramic versions, to be bought and displayed in some of the more fashionable parlors, and the writer, Henry James, remembered seeing her in his youth, so undressed, yet so refined, even so pensive, in sugar-white alabaster, exposed under little domed glass covers in such American houses as could bring themselves to think such things right. But like any success, the Greek slave bred imitations. In 1859, the American sculptor Erastus Dow Palmer produced a statue called the White Captive in a composition almost identical to the Greek slave, but with one chained hand behind her back for the purpose of more fully revealing the nude torso of the subject. The subject is not of a Greek, but of a young American woman taken captive, not by the heathen Turks, but by the savage Indians. And so it came to pass that the American public in the mid-19th century did come to accept nudity in art, but they did so on their own terms, and understanding that is vital to the understanding of American sculpture. To the literal-minded, practical, and pragmatic American, nudity, like everything else, must have utility, a purpose, a reason for being. Beauty was fine and good, and works of art, of course, should be beautiful, but the beauty of the figure should be subservient to the message of the work. And when you think of it, that sentiment really isn't any different from the neoclassical impulse in Europe occurring at the same time. The purpose of the ideal nude in neoclassicism is to point the viewer past the physicality of the work and into loftier sentiment. The Greek slave is no different, but conveys its sentiment through narrative rather than ideality. Now, the rapid succession of American sculpture which displayed the nude figure immediately after the Greek slave quickly abandoned this European ideal nude, based on the antique, for a more naturalistically rendered, individualized form, which better suited narrative structure favored in American sculpture. With this understanding, it's easy to see why the subject of the American Indian became such a popular subject in 19th century American art. The partial or complete nudity of such figures is entirely plausible within the narrative. And thankfully, the subject of the Native American in figurative art quickly evolved in the 19th century from being seen as a savage in need of taming to a subject worthy of admiration and empathy. This tradition of American art, for better or worse, still runs strong today, though the most common sentiment in these contemporary compositions depicting Native Americans usually runs towards romanticized nostalgia. As for Hiram Powers, the success of the Greek slave afforded him fame and accolades and commissions for the rest of his life. He became an instructor at the Academia in Florence, and he lived the rest of his life here 
and is actually buried here, in the same small cemetery where Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Fanny Trollope are interred, as well as dozens of other notable 19th century English and American expatriates to Florence. But in spite of his evident love of Florence, Hiram Powers always considered himself an American sculptor, and the success of the Greek slave enabled him to pursue what he saw as American sculpture. He produced several full-size figures of various allegories of idealized types, including his statues of an allegorical America, an allegory of California, and others. But none of these works really ever rose to the level of the Greek slave in the estimation of his American audience, mostly because it doesn't appear that Hiram Powers fully learned the lesson the Greek slave taught everybody else, the lesson that the neoclassical ideal in sculpture had little to offer the culture of the New World. Americans were literate, but they were also literal. If morals were to be imparted by a work of art, they need to come in the form of a good story, not from allegorical figures of obscurely symbolic women in togas. Now, near the end of his life, Hiram produced a statue which sought to return to a more narrative subject, and he chose to address the newly popular genre of the American Indian. This statue he produced is called The Last of the Tribes, and it depicts a half-nude female in the act of running, ostensibly fleeing from the advance of European settlement. Now, what could have been a moving and emotional sculpture is stopped dead in its tracks by the overt idealizing and classicizing Powers chose for the figure. I mean, she's really just a Greek Venus in an Indian skirt. To me, this statue seems to be an attempt to please European audiences with its noble, restrained sentiment, while attempting to please American audiences with its subject, but it ends up pleasing neither. This attempt at a reconciliation between the sculptural needs and expectations of the two continents and their divergent cultures only served to heighten their differences. While Hiram Powers was away in Italy, American figurative sculpture had become its own thing, born out of, but now one step removed from its European origins. I want to thank you all for listening. Now don't forget to check out additional content at our YouTube channel for the Sculptor's Funeral and also on our Facebook group page. And at the Facebook page, you can join in the conversation, do the whole online networking thing with like-minded sculptors and sculpture lovers from all over the globe. Go ahead, ask a question, post current events, and get to know me and your fellow sculptors a little better. Also, it's been quite a while since I mentioned giving the podcast a rating on iTunes or from wherever you get your podcasts from. Now, rating the Sculptor's Funeral at iTunes or on your podcast app helps increase the visibility of the podcast to other people like yourselves who might want to listen in. So if you can find it in your heart to give me a rating or even write a line or two telling me what you think about the podcast, it would be very helpful. So thanks for that. And don't forget, you can go to the website of the podcast, thesculptorsfuneral.com, where you can not only listen to the entire back catalog of episodes, but you can also visit the image gallery for this and for other episodes. And while you're there, at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can click on the Blick Art Supplies link, which takes you to the Blick Art Supplies site, where you can support the podcast simply by buying from Blick. And for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.